but we will see. Okay, James, ready? Yes, I am. Okay, let's start recording now. So good morning, everybody. And welcome again to this uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia Colloquium. And today, we will have uh, the presence of Dr. James Chibuese from the Northwest University in South Africa. And he will talk uh, about the unveiling the unseen magnetized universe with Meerkat. Uh, Dr. Chibuese will be properly introduced by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, good morning. Everybody, thank you very much for coming again to a new uh, Severo Ochoa uh, web document this time again. And uh, uh, especially, uh, we are th thankful to uh, Dr. James Chibueze, who accepted our invitation to provide this uh, colloquium. Um, James, please, uh, um, I'd like to extend this invitation to an in person one in the future when possible. And thank you very much for ac accepting our invitation. Um, James Chibuese did his Bachelor of Science in, uh, in Physics, uh, first class and Master of Science in Astrophysics at the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the University of Nigeria. And he then proceeded to Japan for his uh, PhD in Radio Astronomy and, uh, and Astrophysics at Kagoshima University uh, when, uh, when he received his PhD in, in 2013 under the Japanese government next scholarship. Uh, James Chibwet joins East Asia ELMA Regional Center at the National Astronomical Observatory of uh, Japan as project uh, research fellow in 2013 and later, the, the year after, was appointed as a project assistant professor. In 2015, he moved to University of Nigeria as lecturer and two years later, uh, he moved to South African uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory, Sarao, formerly known as the Square Kilometer Array South Africa, yeah. as a VLBI Commissioning Scientist. In 2019, he joined Northwest University, where he is now as Associate Professor, and uh, he has recently promoted to full professor in, in astrophysics. His research is mainly focused on the high-resolution study of massive star formation processes from the earliest to uh, evolutionary stages. And in the recent years, uh, James has uh, used Mercat telescope to expand his research horizon to include the study of radio galaxy and galaxy clusters. So today, as René said, uh, he's talking about the unveiling the unseen magnetized universe with uh, Mercat. Thank you very much again, James, uh, for accepting an invitation and the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, good day, everyone. Can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak in this very good colloquium and to have opportunity to speak and see some of my collaborators from IAA. It's really a privilege uh, for me to do that. So today, I won't take a lot of time. I would like to show you some of the fantastic results that um, have been opportune to produce with the Miyakat telescope. Uh, I won't talk about myself, but I will speak about how we can study magnetized universe using MIACAD. So you can find indirect means of unveiling the existence of magnetic field within galaxy clusters. So I would start with what we currently know about active galactic nucleus, what people will sometimes call radio galaxies. It is typically um, basic knowledge that there is a, always a supermassive black hole at the center of radio galaxies and that the supermassive black, black hole launch relativistic jets. This is essentially uh, relativistic electrons that are uh, spiraling along the magnetic field lines that moves out from the poles of the radio galaxy. Well, depending on the inclination of or the orientation of the galaxy in the sky, 
what you see of the radio galaxy will be different, uh, prompting astronomers to classify radio galaxies into different kinds, uh, which includes quasars when it is oriented and pointed towards us and you see a purely compact thing, and blazers when it's slightly inclined and you see one side of a loop, and radio galaxies when you see both sides and it's inclined in the plane of the sky. Um, however, the knowledge of the jets as being bipolar is common, but could change depending on the environment where the radio galaxy finds itself. For example, what if I told you the beautiful jets you see here can bend 90 degrees towards the north eastern region in the plane of the sky. Well, that is one of the things I will show you today, that it is possible and that the reason we see that is because there are strong magnetic fields within galaxy clusters. And I'll also explain some of the results, how those magnetic fields can be produced. Let's start with merging galaxy clusters. We know galaxy clusters is simply a number of galaxies of different kinds and different ages clustered together and being gravitationally bound. However, if you have two of such clusters coming together to form one bigger cluster, you call that a merging process. In the animation you see, you see some bright orange colored parts that represents um, the hot plasma that is produced and concentrated around the center of a galaxy cluster. So in the results I will show you uh, subsequently, it will be that of um, a merging galaxy cluster that has generated a strong magnetic field layer, which will cause a radio galaxy that is a member of the galaxy cluster to bend its jet, the direction of the jet. So, the key question, which I would um, want to attempt to answer, is how does the intracluster magnetic field affect cluster member galaxies? Of course, within this um, huge galaxy cluster, there is magnetic field distribution. How does this magnetic field within the cluster affect the galaxies that are part of galax a galaxy cluster? in this case, a merging galaxy cluster. So look out for the answer to that with respect to one of the galaxies that we focused on in this study. Maybe I need to highlight that the, the results I will show you today has been published in Nature in May of this year. So I will also point you to that paper if you want more details. Now I start with what we call cold fronts. So I'm going to explain some of the concepts that I will be mentioning as I show you the results from Meerkat. Cold front is simply some form of magnetic field amplification. How we find this in observations is through observing in the X-ray. If you point um, an X-ray telescope, say the XMM or Chandra, you pick up the hot gas emission coming from the center of a galaxy cluster. Now, you can also try to look at the radial profile of the X-ray emission, say from where you identify as the center of the cluster, and you can look at the um, number of hot electrons, okay, as you move radially outward. If you do that, you could reproduce the plot on the right-hand side, where you would be able to look at carefully uh, the X-ray profile. This will show you, like in this case, a decay, which is typically of collision of plasma. However, if you go further outward, sometimes you could find a deviation from collision of plasma where you see um, a density jump. This discontinuity is what we typically call cold front. And this is a deviation from collision of plasma towards something that is more of magnetic field. There has been a couple of, a number of literatures that try to measure what the magnetic field strength is around where you have this discontinuity in the profile and the derived magnetic fields, sometimes up to 14 microgauss, 
Um, another one from Ebel 2204 found magnetic field up around 20, 20 micro gauss, great, slightly greater than that. So this process can, these magnetic field layers that we, you find by looking at the uh, profile of the um, X-ray emission could be formed as a result of the merging process, which can lead to um, some sloshing process. Sloshing is when you have some kind of splash, okay? You have a subcluster field splashing into another subcluster field, and that could um, be done through induced, sloshing through induced gas motion. So what this does is simply put to compress magnetic field lines and generate a region where you have amplified magnetic field. There is a couple of simulations to demonstrate that. Um, and I'll highlight the one from Asai et al. in 2007, where he tried to put in magnetic field lines, as you can see here, and then allow a subcluster material to run into these field lines. What you would see in the end of the, what they saw in the end of their simulation is that these magnetic field lines, as this subcluster material run into it, it wraps around it. And this process of wrapping around is called magnetic draping. This enhances the magnetic field around this layer. And you can see some of the snapshots from the simulation from time zero to time one giga year, where you now have enhancement of magnetic field layer around here. And at this point, this is where you have the cold front, which you can see as density jump in X-ray observation. And you can see uh, the beta um, values. So the typical results they, they found from this simulation is that you could find the ratio of the thermal pressure to that of magnetic pressure to start approaching towards one. So magnetic field pressure becomes slightly higher so as to somehow cancel out most of the thermal pressure. And this is good. So it simply tells us that the production of strong magnetic layer or regions where you have strong magnetic field within a cluster can be caused by the motion of a subcluster material that drapes magnetic field around it and increase the magnetic field strength. That point we are going to use in the result to explain what we see. Okay, now the next thing is to introduce you to Abel 3376. This is a fairly famous um, double relic uh, galaxy cluster. It is a merging galaxy cluster was observed with the VLA um, by Bakshi et al. in 2006, which was published in Science, where they found um, these beautiful radio relics, um, both to the east and to the west. The background image is XMM Newton X-ray emission, and it shows a nice elongated uh, X-ray blob with the eastern tip being the strongest part of the emission. There has been so many other observations. There are observations in uh, and literature in optical. There is uh, neutral hydrogen measurements by Keka et al. in 2020. There is also a couple of simulations um, which are quite good. I will highlight Machado's simulation that was published in 2013. And there are a number of um, X-ray studies towards this galaxy cluster. I'll show some of those. So, in the case of Masajo, Machado et al. Uh, 2013, they showed how you can reproduce the morphology of the X-ray emission by assuming um, mass ratio between the two merging clusters to be one is to 10, and they tried to simulate how this merger would form and how um, the hot gas motion will evolve over time. The interesting thing out of this simulation is you are able to nicely, um, over a couple of giga years, mirror the same image we see in this S-ray. And yeah, you can see the some kind of cometary structure, which is a subcluster material moving in this direction after the 
um, merging process or during the merging process because it's still merging. And if you flip this around, you simply have the same sort of um, structure that we have in this S3. I'll try to move that a bit forward so we can. So that's a zooming to just increase your viewpoint and you can see how you generate a comet structure here, which if you, if you flip it um, in a plane of the sky, you can have what we see from the X-ray. So that's the simulation from Machado, which is quite nice. Um, within 1.6 giga years, you're able to produce that. And this is a real image from XMM Newton, which is a nice reproduction of the morphology we see. But the interesting part of that, this um, source is a radio galaxy that is here. Before I show that, I will show you a measurement by Ondan Pileta, who took the X-ray data from XMM Newton, looked at the radial profile, and found a cold front at this point. Um, Akamatu et al. Uh, also looked at this same data, looked for radial profile in all directions, and found another um, code front. Uh, I, I use code front because I have explained it. Found another area of strong magnetic field, which is code front around this the region my pointer is. This is interesting because there is this radio galaxy which wasn't very well resolved in the previous um, VLA observation. This is actually um, contour lines of two radio galaxies. There is one here, and this is a second one. And I'll show you that in the Meerkat higher resolution observations. Uh, but the focus of the results will be on this. I'll show you that later. And this is the second brightest um, cluster galaxy member within the galaxy cluster, and it's called MRC0600 minus 399. So I've shown you a few of the previous results from that galaxy cluster. Now it's time to have a look at the Meerkat observations and the fantastic image we got from it. The Meerkat is a 64-dish antenna located in the Karoo Desert in, in South Africa. And it's an excellent instrument. I will just stop there. I know most of you already know that this is a nice instrument to use. So in the observation, which um, we conducted in 2019, remember um, this object has got double relics. So we centered the first one in one relic and second one centered in the second relic. So those are the two pointings. Each of the pointing lasting um, about eight hours. The, we use the 4K mode observation. We, we're not very much interested in spectral line. Well, I did image the hydrogen one, um, but I wouldn't discuss that here because it's very poor velocity resolution because you have only 4,096 channels and the bandwidth is 856 megahertz running from 856 megahertz to 1,712 megahertz. The channel width is about 209 kilohertz, and we centered the frequency, the center frequency is uh, 1,283 megahertz. So if you collect this data, of course, um, Meerkat data it can be very huge, um, runs into terabytes. Um, you calibrate, flag, you run the pipeline, and then you repeat the process many times, you get your final image. And the final image looks like that. So I'm not going to focus on the relics today. Uh, probably in the future, I'll show you some fantastic new things that we found about the relics. But you can see that Miyaka did much, much better than the VLA. Of course, this is expected because you have more antennas. But what is important is that we did more than twice better the angular resolution uh, that VLA could achieve at the same wavelength. Maybe because the observation was done in a very compact configuration. So ignoring the radio relics, um, this is the X-ray emission in blue. The background um, is the optical. 
And what you see in a most purplish color is the radio emission from meerkat. The focus would be on this radio galaxy. Remember, you can do just about anything with this fantastic image, but we want to focus on this interesting structure. If you zoom into that radio galaxy, you'll find two things. You'll find that this object, which wasn't separate before in the VLA, is totally a separate galaxy. Um, it does have a bend, which we see of typical wide angle tail um, galaxies. They usually bend and you will see a plume structure at the end of the, the loops of the jet. So this is what you see. We will ignore galaxy B and focus on MROC 0600-399. So if you look carefully, one of the first things you start seeing is you find synchrotron radiation that is stretching close to 100 kiloparsecs um, east of the direction of the launch of these jets. Uh, the, this position shows the optical peak. So you can imagine that is the central engine driving these radio jets. So this emission was the biggest surprise because now it looks fairly, not completely detached, but it seems to be coming from this object. Also, you could imagine maybe something else is driving this emission. So the first job is to look for what could cause this kind of nicely collimated synchrotron radiation. So we searched for possible sources around this that could drive this. There was none. We concluded that this is definitely related to this radio jet. Also, the fact that we see, we see it again in the southern side of the jet. There is another interesting thing. These tiny faint fingers, I call it fingers, or collimated emission coming out of this um, radio galaxy. We named these double sites. Um, sorry, my background is slightly Japanese. I don't watch a lot of animations, but there is one that you maybe some people have seen that has some kind of weapon. I don't like violence, but I'm just using this to illustrate what we call this. This is a site. So it's a site with double side, an elongated side and a small side protruding on the other side. And this represents the elongated side, and that's the other small side. Therefore, we call this a double side structure. So that's where the name came from, from that animation, which is Japanese. The part we've marked in red is the part that we have um, identified as the spot where the bending of that jet happened. This bend is nearly 90 degrees. Of course, you could have 90 degrees for wide angle tail galaxy, but it will end up in a plume um, open structure in the end. But this guy is bent and stayed collimated for over 100 kiloparsecs. Good, so that is fascinating, but we need to explain what is going on in that object. So if you go back to the story of cold front, the background in this image is the X-ray emission and the contour lines is the radio galaxy okay, that we're looking at. And here is the lines from the magnetic field uh, on Dampileta published in 2018. And this is the cold front line that uh, Hiroki um, Akamatu et al. found um, in 2021. So here is um, real data, real observational data profile of the X-ray. You see that nice collisional plasma decay, but here you have the constriction that veers of collisional plasma profile. And this is what you see in the radio. You see um, some kind of brightening up to this peak, and then it drops off after where the constriction is. So this shows us that we have some cold fronts around this region. Remember that this subcluster material is moving eastward. Okay. So this is compressing magnetic field lines around this 
causing uh, magnetic draping around this line. This is more or less illustrated here. So this will represent the magnetic draped environment. So to the reason why we think it is magnetic field instead of what um, galaxy cluster astronomers or radio galaxy astronomers call ramp pressure is that ramp pressure pushes in the opposite direction. The direction of propagation of um, this subcluster field is in the direction. So if there should be ramp pressure, it should go towards the west. That's the gas flow direction. Therefore, if these jets were bent towards the west in the opposite direction, we may have argued that this is just ramp pressure pushing the jets backward. But this is moving against ramp pressure, which was really very surprising. Good. So to now understand what is going on in this field, the next thing is to generate the spectral index and the uh, brightness profile of the synchrotron radiation. And that is what you have here. To do this, we split the 856 megahertz bandwidth that we have into eight subbands. And then we generate the image of each subband and we calculate the spectral index of each pixel and create a spectral index map of this object. And in the end, we put in ellipses along the bent jet and take the average and of course the deviation um, of the spectral indices. So in this plot, you would see regions marked with N1 just means not region one towards the north and N2 and N3. And we did the same for the south where we have only S1 and S2. I need to add that the reason why we don't see a nicely elongated and collimated um, synchrotron emission in the south is as a result of projection effect. So what is happening in the north is occurring in the south, but the projection effects make us not to see the south very nicely. So we focus on the north. If you look at the intensities on N1, as you expect with the cooling of the electrons within the jet, um, the intensities will drop. Of course, the spectral index will decay. And by the time you get to the point we call bend point, this flattens, meaning that something is enhancing the intensity, making it to brighten. You see the um, flattening of the um, flux densities and also the flattening of the spectral index. And then towards entry, you see this decay resumes again. This is typical decay you would see in radio galaxy. So this is uh, just relativistic propagation of electrons and then it cools and you see the decay. We see something fairly similar in the south, but as I mentioned, the projection effect makes it fairly not too possible to constrain nicely. Okay, so this tells us there is something here that is make, brightening this jet. What exactly is it? Well, the next thing you can do is to put this into, plug this into um, magnetohydrodynamical uh, simulation. And we did that and were able to reproduce the bent jet nicely. Remember in this case, we don't consider the projection so we can show you nicely at 90 degrees inclination um, the bent jet. So we reproduce the N1 region, the N2, and a fairly bit the N3 region. So you can recalculate the radio, radio profile and the X-ray profile from the uh, MHD simulation data. And if you do that, you would be able to reproduce around N2 the uh, kink this discontinuity, which is caused by magnetic draping, which we call cold front. So this nicely mirrored what you see in observation. Uh, these other three images is just showing you a snapshot. This is a snapshot of 
the simulation at 225 mega years. And you see the launch path of the jets where it interacts with magnetic field. The enhancement happens here because of magnetic reconnection. And then you see some of the electrons couple into the magnetic field, so producing this double site structure. And that there is the um, current density, and this is the Joule heating, um, Joule heat profile. And you can see clearly that around the enhancement region that there is evidence of magnetic field playing a key role. Okay, so we put this all together and concluded that the interaction we see um, or the enhancement we see in the radial, uh, sorry, in the spectral index profile and in the flux density profile is as a result of the jet interacting with a region where there is stronger magnetic field, which is evident in S-ray observation showing um, some density jump, which we call discontinuities, which is also called cold front. Here is what uh, um, an animation or uh, a part of the simulation looks like. Um, we use, initially we use 60 micro gauss for the MHC simulation. The referees of nature said, well, that is too high. You should try to use something comparable to um, magnetic field strength that is observable in radio galaxy, sorry, in galaxy clusters. And then we tried uh, 10 micro gauss and we were still able to find um, the bending of the jet. So you launch the jet, that is your draped magnetic field line. It interacts with the jet and you have enhancement at that spot, which um, helps you create this nice uh, double site structure. So this simulation really nicely reproduce um, what we see in the data. So here I'm going to show you um, a 3D view uh, we made this animation for the press release. You put in your magnetic drift, magnetic field lines, and you launch your jet. So the, this is just the cooling, the electrons lose energy, you see a decay. And here you start seeing the magnetic, um, there is tension, magnetic tension as the jets interact with magnetic field layer. And of course you have magnetic reconnection, which enhances the intensity in this region and causes um, the bending of the jet. Some of the electrons go to both sides of the magnetic field lines. And that is what you see as double side structure. Uh, this is just to flip around the jet. So you can see the streaming of the electrons through the magnetic field from the jet and how it gets to the point where it interacts. And that is the bend point. And you see clearly that, that the uh, synchrotron radiation here is enhanced due to the magnetic reconnection and the fence things you see here, which was not detectable with uh, VLA is now picked up by meerkats. They are quite faint, but they were detected with more than 10 sigma in our observation. And that is a double side structure and a couple of uh, fingers which I showed earlier in the images. Okay. So you can clearly see that double side structure, which is similar to what we see in our simulation and also similar to what we see in, in our radio observations. So to, to give you a holistic idea of what, what is in this result, you have compressed magnetic field lines due to, um, magnetic draping, um, the motion of the subcluster material is in this direction, and the jet is launched uh, in the fairly north-south direction. It interacts with this um, dripped magnetic field. So first of all, you see enhancements. This is N2 region, where we have um, enhancement of the intensity due to um, magnetic reconnection. Some of the electrons are now later and now subsequently coupled into this, um, into the magnetic layer in intracluster magnetic layer and they travel relativistically and this will cause decay 
in the spectral index again. So you have a decay, an enhancement, and another decay that is N1, N2, N3. This is just the B galaxy, which is a typical wide angle tail galaxy. So ramp pressure is in this direction. The, the jet is not bent that direction. So ramp pressure is not the reason for the bend, rather we think it's magnetic field. Okay, so that's the story in this paper, which shows that when we see radio galaxies, we can just look at radio galaxies within galaxy clusters and we pay attention to their morphology. If the morphology is strange, like this one that is bent by 90 degrees, then we can explore more about the spectral profile. If we do that, we also at the same time look at the X-ray um, data to find cold fronts and see if it corresponds to the region where we see a sharp change in the spectral index profile. And then we could conclude that we are seeing magnetic field, which typically we will not easily see. So the next question is, is this the only case where we have um, magnetic, strong magnetic field causing problems or bending jets? The answer is no. Um, while our paper was in a nine months long review with nature, with all the back and forth, uh, this paper was um, submitted in the archive as, as at that time, and we were in contact with, with the authors, and we thought this was also a case of bending because this is a cold front also. That is another case for in Abel 1775. Uh, so there are many of these cases, and they can become a means of looking at the magnetized universe. That is not all you can do with Meerkat, but that's all I can tell you about the bent jet. Of course, I will take questions, but Meerkat is so sensitive that you can do just about anything except things that require you to do extremely high resolution. Meerkat's resolution, remember the longest baseline is only eight kilometers. So the resolution, probably you can get to five arc seconds or slightly below that. So it's not good for my first science love, which is to observe um, forming massive stars, which you need extremely high resolution to resolve. Um, but I'm just highlighting one other thing you can do with meerkats. You can take advantage of the extreme sensitivity um, and study things like uh, star planet interaction. I've shown a result um, that show evidence of planet um, star planet interaction by Miguel, um, which I, I was part of. Um, and then the data we have from Miguel's Miakat BI project. This is still very confidential. We have, I think, more than 18 epochs of observation towards uh, Proxima Centauri. And gradually, we are getting the results out. So yes, um, there are a lot of things you can do with Meerkat. If you're keen to use Meerkat, please feel free to contact me. There are a few data on galaxy clusters. We also have um, full galactic plane survey uh, data, which will be released soon, as soon as we publish the first <laughs> introductory paper. So I will be happy to have a lot of you who are interested to use Meerkat. And if you need help, I am happy to assist however I can. I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for this uh, very nice presentation. And uh, now the talk is open for questions. Please, <clears throat> to the uh, participants, raise your hand, and uh, then uh, we can uh, give you the question. Miguel, please, go on. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, James, for this uh, nice uh, presentation of your, your work on these um, clusters, really spectacular images. I think you, it would be beneficial if you just give a, a, a few numbers that are representative of how sensitive um, is um, America and also the angular resolution. So for people that might be interested. So of course, we know because of this, uh, that, that was one of the reasons we asked for these um, observations with Proxima, I mean, with, the, with Mercat, 
is extremely, extremely sensitive. So maybe, I mean, and I, I understand this beautiful image you showed really require, requires, I mean, it requires eight hours. So I guess the RMS must have been, you know, close to one micro or whatever. So could you just give a few numbers so people have a, you know, can, can put this into context and they, they can think of any use for their own science? Thanks. Yeah. So for this eight-hour observation, this one specifically, we achieved, uh, we're close to the thermal noise. Meerkat's thermal noise is around two or three microjansky per beam. So we got 4.2 microjansky per beam in, in this image, the image I'm showing you now. So that three sigma will bring you more or less to 13 or 14 microjansky per beam, which is extremely sensitive. Um, it's also a function of um, your observation time and how many antennas participated in the observations. I remember Miguel in our project, we were just running in Milijansky scale um, of RMS because the time on source was only 30 minutes or 29 minutes. Yeah, yeah we, we had uh, something like 20, 20 minutes on source or maybe 17, but it's still the RMS is something like um, uh, 20 microjansky per beam. So it's quite, it's very nice. I mean, for this, definitely for this time on source, this is very good. Um, could you also maybe mention that the resolution, the angular resolution achieved by America that this uh, free, the central frequency of 1.2 gigahertz, so people also are aware of this. So if, if you are fortunate and you have, well, most of the time, the longest baseline is quite good the eight kilometer baseline antenna, we call it M63. If it's part of the observation, you can easily achieve five arc seconds resolution. Uh, but if you, if you lose the long baseline antennas, maybe because it's in maintenance or something, you could go, go down to a few tenths or 10 arc seconds. Of course, you can always um, degrade the resolution by tapering, but the highest you can achieve is roughly around five arc seconds. Okay, thanks. Are there any, any prospects to, to enlarge? Well, I, I know they, they are in, in initially, but uh, how, are they, how is going forward uh, Mercat, Mercat in terms of uh, angular resolution extending the, the, the array? Okay, so the, there was a funding approval from the Max Planck Institute to add 20 more antennas to the Meerkat and stretch the baseline to um, 20 kilometer baseline, extend the baseline to 20 kilometers. Um, this contract has been signed. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to speak to that, but the agreement is signed. The, um, time for the contribution of the 20 telescope has been awarded to Max Planck Institute already. This is managed by um, Michael Kramer. If you know him, you can write him an email directly. He's doing a galactic plane survey looking for new pulsars. So in exchange for the money investment and additional dishes, they get um, telescope time. They are also adding X-band receivers paying for the X-band receivers on the Miyaka telescope. So yes, we can go down to, again, depending, two arc seconds or just below one arc second resolution when, when they add the 20 antennas and stretch to 20 kilometer baseline. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Miguel. And we have another question by Marilu Gendron, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, James, very nice talk. Um, really beautiful results. Um, I had a question about the, the other um, Benjet radio galaxy, just like the, the smaller one. Maybe you mentioned it, but uh, so in, in that case, uh, what's the, that... like the, this one, yeah, the, the the, the smaller one. Yes. Yeah. So, what's the explanation for for this one? Is it is it also that would that one would be ram pressure or something else? So this is also ma magnetic field play a role 
in wide angle tail galaxies. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference between this and mm -hmm. the other one is the collimation of the synchrotron emission. So here it becomes more diffuse. It forms plume structures yeah. after the interaction. Um, but they stayed collimated, which is not common. So this okay. is magnetic field as well. Okay. And then and then so so the gas is going in in this direction and then it, it's bending the jet in a normal way and it diffuses after okay. The yeah. the difference with the other one is that this one stays collimated, right? Yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we have another question by Isabel. Please, go on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, James. Very good talk. Um, very interesting. Um, I have a general question um, regarding the, um, the importance of magnetic fields and ramp pressure stripping for the whole picture of, uh, of the evolution of galaxies and clusters. Um, uh, as far as I understand, you're saying that in at least in those cases, there is a clear uh, important effect or um, I mean, the most important effect could be coming from the magnetic field. But what 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 could be the um, the general impact for our understanding of clusters and the uh, morphological change and so on in clusters with respect to um, as compared with the rub pressure stripping? Okay, I I think that's that's quite an interesting question. Um, I'll try to go a few slides back. So if you if you imagine that there is a huge magnetic field line here, okay? Very strong magnetic field line around this region. Then we could use that to explain what we see in this relic. So how um, you reaccelerate uh, particles within a galaxy cluster could be explained by uh, the existence of uh, cold fronts, which is strong magnetic field lines. We don't have detailed explanation yet, but we have a second paper coming out where we see strange morphologies in, in relics, which is real, uh, well, we can look at the physics of particle reacceleration, but we can also use it to understand how the galaxy cluster could evolve over time. Um, how that the magnetic field line will affect individual galaxies I would not be able to give an, a direct answer to that, but I think the evolution of MROC um, 0600-399 will be strongly affected by that magnetic field lines. Uh, if things continue to stay collimated, maybe the, the galaxy will stay as a radio jet for a longer time. Um, you know, radio galaxies, uh, when they get older, the spectral index around the engine okay, becomes weaker. So there is a possibility that this could affect the age and the evolutionary timeline of the galaxy. But how, we, we are not yet clear about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that the, um, I guess that you cannot explain everything with, with the magnetic fields because you, yeah. you see morphologies of the uh, star, stellar distributions also. Yeah changed by the ram pressure effect, right? So that's, yes. okay. Um, there is also another part that um, the referees actually insisted we add a second possible explanation um, for this. They try to call it a uh, slingshot. You know, if you tie a stone to a ring and then fling it, uh, you could use that to explain what you see here. They said, that maybe that the um, electrons here are seeing the motion of the subcluster field. Mm -hmm. Okay, they see this motion of the subcluster field and they try to follow it. Um, that explanation is quite valid. Uh, it was suggested by one of the referees. We included it in just one or two sentences in the nature paper. Um, but if you consider that to be the case, then you will struggle to explain the collimation over 100 kiloparsecs. You still need strong magnetic field to keep it collimated. If, if the slingshot is true, you're going to have um, diffuse emission everywhere and not very collimated. 
Okay. Yeah. And j just a short question, just in, in, the, in the same image you're showing right now, where, where's the position of the uh, brightest cluster galaxy in, in, in there? Okay. More that or is, less, more or less. <laughs> it's this, one of these two, I didn't measure the fluxes again, but it's okay. one of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you said before, okay. Thank you, thank you very much again. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Isabel. At some time, I saw the hand of Gillian. It was him. Actually, it was me, Mayra Osorio. Okay, if you want to ask before Miguel, yes. Go uh, on. Thank you very, very much for this nice uh, uh, talk. Uh, the simulations are amazing. Uh, perhaps you mentioned, but I would like to ask you, if you can constrain the, the strength of magnetic field, which is causing the blending of the outflow. If I can constrain the strength of the magnetic field, which is yes. causing the bending. Yes, this is my question. Yes, so I would say it's a range. If you go up to 60 micro gauss, you could still bend it. Maybe, um, let me try to understand your question to mean, what is the minimum magnetic field you will require to bend the jet? Yet it would be inter interesting to constrain it. Yes, so we, we tried to do that. I think we got down to seven micro gauss and we still saw a bend. Okay, thank you. Seven micro. Okay, Miguel, go on. Um, yeah, um, thanks, um, thanks, um, James. I think um, I would like to, to elaborate, if you could elaborate a bit more on the, on the answer to the question by my Marilou. Because to be honest, I also had the same kind of uh, misunderstanding. When you show the image, the, you focus, you go, you go to the zoom image into the two, um, the two bands. Yes, yes, that's that's the correct one. And then you explain that well, this cannot be due to run pressure, because then we should actually see this uh, bending in the other side, right? Uh, the other, in the opposite direction. Yes. Uh, but. Then uh, you explain the whole thing for the for the larger galaxy. So does this the same explanation apply to the smaller the small the smaller jet that is also bent in basically the same way? But yeah, so um, I think it was applied to the same jet to this one as well. Because let me show one more step. You can see that this nicely cuts through this. Okay. Um, if you imagine that, it's, that this, this is a, a layer, it's not a single line, it's a layer of magnetic field uh, in 3D shape. So these jets will be hitting the layer, which is curved in, in, to, the, to this guy. But this is, um, this, this particular case, it's just a simple interaction of the southern jet that causes the wide angle tail. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the important thing is, is not the ram the, the ram pressure. No, right? I, I don't. This is not ram pressure. Ram pressure would this curve this arc you see here. If this is ram pr pressure, it should it should go the other side. The other side. That's correct. That's there. Yeah, that was also my understanding. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. And I think the other point also is that this is the tip of this subcluster material that is moving. So this is at the tip. It may be going to be difficult for run pressure to push this back for, it's, it's like pushing the subcluster material is pushing to the east, run pressure to, this, to the west. Um, and magnetic field also helping. So I think the, um, the wide angle tail we see there is magnetic field and some fraction of the impact of this comet. Okay, this link, the soft cluster material. Yeah, very spectacular. Yeah, I, the, you need this kind of images, sensitivity and resolution to be able to, to tackle those questions. Otherwise, yeah. There can yes. be many possible explanations. So yeah, congrats for this. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Miguel. And um, I see Isabel hand up, but maybe it's from the last question. There is also. Yes, it is. Sorry, I, I forgot to, to put it down. Okay, so let's go for Amidu. Hi, um, yes. Very, very nice talk, James, and good to see you again. So I have a quick question about the orientation of the, um, the jets. Um, I'm assuming that the north, northern side is the side that is approaching, that is nearest to us? If... Uh, the northern side is in the plane of the sky, not necessarily nearer to us. OK, so the two sides of the jets are not contained in the same plane? No. So if you imagine that this is the jet, it could be inclined that way to you. Okay. I see. So if it's inclined that way, depending on where you look at it from, you see different orientation for the pending. Okay. I was going to ask you if um, the, the jets from the two elements here, from the two objects are more or less on the same plane, um, you know, in the same plane. And uh, if so, then could there be, if we could, if let's say you were able, I should have probably paid more attention to uh, the animation that you showed, but if for some reason you were able to go deeper in sensitivity, do you think that at some point we could get, we could see a connection between the two objects? And also, you know, even with uh, these jets and the, the relics that is, you know, at a much, much a larger scale. I, do, I, I know you didn't want to speak about that, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, these two galaxies are not close to each other. Of course, if you pick out radio emission and you don't have good um, resolution, this can blend into this in the plane of the sky. So this is an independent galaxy. Probably in the foreground, the galaxy cluster is a huge field, is probably in the background. Um, yeah, in the background of our line of sight. Okay, and this guy is in the foreground. Um, so if you have high resolution, this is totally, totally independent, different galaxy doing its own thing. Um, what was your other question again? On oh, if, if there was a possibility that this uh, whole system that, you know, the zoom in version is somehow connected to the relics that is at a much, much larger scale. Okay, so these two galaxies uh, don't connect to this, to the relics. Let me try to do that again. So this don't connect to this. We're doing a different paper where we explain um, the supply chain of um, electrons to the relics to be coming from another radio galaxy that is known here and that one. And you can see this nice trail um, of electrons, of reaccelerated electrons. So I think in terms of connecting to the relics, you would be looking at these other two radio galaxies. But for these two, we don't see any evidence that they, they link to these um, relics. I don't know if I answered your question. Like... Yes, yes, very much clear. Thank you. OK. OK, thank you, Midu. Any other question for James? If not, I think we can close this uh, very nice talk. And thank you again, again, James. And of course, as Isabel told you, you are invited to come here when we normalize the situation. No thank problem. You much. I leave my email. If you have any other questions, comments, if you want to ask about Miakat, please feel free to drop me a line. OK, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Thanks so much. Thank you.